Jazz Lab Band under the direction of Steve Wright. Just a couple of items before our next talk here. I haven't mentioned this, but sitting up in front, on, to the right of me here, is a display of actual Nobel Prize medals. And so if you would like to see them, we have them sitting over here. And for the benefit of those of you who visit us regularly, I'd like you to get out your calendars. Next year, the Nobel Conference, I believe, will be on October 1st and 2nd. The topic is the nature of nurture. We're going to talk about issues in child development, and we're very pleased that so far, Jerome Kagan from Harvard will be with us to talk about temperament. Robert Pullman will be with us to talk about behavior genetics. Eleanor Maccabee will be with us to talk about the role of parenting. And of course, we need somebody to talk about the brains of developing children. And we just learned last week that one of our all-time favorite speakers at this conference, Eric Kandel, who was just awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine last December, has agreed to come back and to talk about the developing brains of children with us. So we're looking forward to a very exciting conference next year as well. At this time, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Associate Professor of Biology, Dr. Colleen Jacks, who will introduce Dr. Prusiner. In 1972, Stanley Prusiner began a residency in neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. He had returned from a fellowship at NIH where he honed his research skills to the site of his medical internship, believing the clinical study of both normal and malfunctioning nervous systems would provide the best foundation to develop a research career in neurobiology. Soon after his return to UCSF, he admitted a patient dying of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD, one of several transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, or TSE diseases. Found both in humans and other animals, TSEs were believed due to the action at, of a slow virus, an infectious agent that caused disease so slowly an organism might be infected for years before showing any symptoms. So began Dr. Prusner's pursuit to isolate and characterize this type of infectious agent. His studies led him to an unorthodox explanation. In 1982, he reported in the journal Science that the sheep TSE, Scrapie, was caused by an agent without genetic information, that is, genetic information in the form of DNA or RNA. Instead, the agent was a proteinaceous infectious particle that he dubbed a prion. Further work by Dr. Prusner and his colleagues demonstrated that the disease-causing prion protein was an abnormally folded version of a normal protein encoded by the individual's own DNA. His ideas regarded as heretical, Dr. Prusner spent well over a decade convincing others of his novel explanation. His status as the trailblazer in this area led to numerous awards, including election to the National Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society of London, and also the award, awarding of the Albert Lasker Award for Basic Medical Research, culminating in his award of the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Dr. Prusner has spent his entire academic career on the faculty at UCSF. The Prion story continues to unfold in his lab there, including the search for drugs that may be effective against Prion diseases. As one virologist was quoted as saying following the announcement of Dr. Prusner's prize, there's another Nobel Prize somewhere in this field. Please greet Dr. Prusner, who will address the current status of his field and its future via satellite in his talk mad cows, demented people, and the biology of prions. <laughs> 
So anytime you're ready, Dr. Prusner. Thank you for that very kind and generous introduction. I hope that you can hear me. And I presume that the slides now are being shown. I want to speak today at this wonderful conference about the prion diseases and tell you a little bit about the basic biology, what we know and don't know, and then to speak to you more about mad cow disease and the transmission to humans. After that, I would like to speak about therapeutic approaches, both with antibodies and what they reveal, and then with some old drugs which are finding new uses, we hope. The diseases that I'll speak about today uh, include Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, as was mentioned in the very kind introduction, gerstmann streusler shanker disease, fatal insomnia, scrapie of sheep, bovine spongiform encephalopathy of cattle, and chronic wasting disease of mule deer and elk. Now, for many years, as you heard, in the introduction, scrapie was thought to be caused by a virus. And that's because the disease is transmissible. The agent is small and filterable. There's a rise in scrapie agent titer that precedes disease. And there are many strains of scrapie agent that produce different patterns of disease. On this slide, I tried to outline some of the history. It really begins with attempts to purify the infectivity. But those attempts really were very, very difficult because the incubation time assay had not been developed. Uh, we've gotten ahead of ourselves here. But once I was able to develop a new assay, which accelerated our studies nearly a hundredfold, following the leads of Richard Marsh and Richard Kimberlin, who popularized the use of hamsters over mice uh, in the late middle 1970s, we were able to develop a purification scheme, as shown in the middle of this slide. And with that, uh, we were able to purify the infectivity sufficiently to characterize it and also to eventually discover the prion protein, which is shown in the third panel of the slide, brought to the very right. Now, following the lead of Tigva Alper and her colleagues, uh, we looked for a nucleic acid. But every time we took the purified preparations and used those preparations to uh, look for a nucleic acid, we were unable to find any evidence for one. But when we approached this looking for a protein, we found that uh, the infectivity was reduced by procedures that modify proteins. So these results argued very clearly at least in my mind, that the pathogen that we were studying causing scrapie was not a virus or a viroid. Now, the reaction of the scientific community in this slide is shown by the long arm, and of course, that's me with brown hair at the time. And these are the people with the long arm, the sharks, uh, who didn't believe all of this, and rightfully so, they needed to be skeptical. But with a lot of data that came not only from my own work, but that of many other people around the world, it became very clear that prions are unique pathogens because they do not have a DNA or RNA genome, and yet they are infectious. They multiply, and they contain only protein. Now, once we just isolated the prion protein that I showed you earlier in that cartoon, we were able to determine the N-terminal sequence, as shown in this slide. And that was with the help of Leroy Hood and his colleagues uh, at Caltech. And then we did reverse genetics in a collaborative study with Charles Weissman, who was in Zurich at the time. And eventually, we were able to work out the PRP gene structure, as shown here. The PRP gene encodes a protein of about 250 amino acids. And there both at the N and at the C termini, small peptides are removed to produce a protein eventually of 209 amino acids. Now, we all have the protein PRPC shown in green. But what happens in the disease is that the green bar is converted into the pink bar. And that 
bar becomes protease resistant, and when we add proteases, we form a protein which is N-terminally truncated of about 142 amino acids that we call PRP2730. Now, we don't know the detailed structure of PRP2730, but I'm going to give you some data which, gives, which shows the latest information that we have about it. We probably know much more about PRPC, and that data comes from studies of recombinant PRP made in bacteria and then the structure determined by NMR spectroscopy. The first big fragment was done by Kurt Wutrich and his colleagues in Zurich, and the one shown here was done by Tom James with the help of Peter Wright and Jane Dyson and many others. And at the left-hand side, you see recombinant PRP composed of three helices and two small beta strands that are shown in the blue. This approximates very closely PRPC isolated from brain, at least based on optical spectroscopy, and that data is shown at the bottom where we have a large amount of alpha helix and very little beta sheet. The big change occurs when PRP scrapie is formed. We see a model to the right that was developed by Fred Cohn and his colleagues. And what happens based upon the optical spectroscopic work is we now have a very large amount of beta sheet. So we believe that helix A disappears based upon antibody studies, and we believe that much of the coil that is N-terminal to helix A, all turns, along with helix A, turns into beta sheet. Now, we've, began to, we've begun recently to get some data to refine this model. Now, unfortunately, we are unable to use NMR spectroscopy because the PRP scrapie can only be made in animals uh, in large quantities. And furthermore, uh, it is insoluble. So we don't know. We need, we need it to be soluble to do solution NMR or to hope to, hope to have any chance of crystallizing it. So what we've gone to are these two-dimensional crystals that form from the N-terminally truncated protein PRP2730 uh, when it folds up and then polymerizes into amyloid rods. And these rods at the end sometimes display the two-dimensional crystals that are shown here. Now, if one takes pictures of these crystals and then does image processing, as shown in the various panels on this slide, and then compares the protein that we looked at in the last slide with a protein that is missing 36 amino acids in the center of it, but still can turn into a prion, then we can begin to look at the differences. And in the lower right-hand panel, one sees these differences, which are shown in the red. So one can now begin to use this and, ask, and know exactly where the 36 amino acids that have been deleted are. They're right in the center where those red images are and one can begin to build new models. And here you see two new models. One of them where we have six of the proteins that fit into this hex hexagonal array, and the other is three. That's shown in panel C. Now, we don't know whether it's three or six, and we're not even sure about this model. But fortunately, we have some brand new equipment which has just been installed meaning that we have a very high-resolution electron microscope in which we hope to get better and better data that will constrain these models. Now, what you see in the next slide is the model of recombinant PRP that I showed you before based upon NMR spectroscopy, so we believe that that data is very, very good. And now a new model of PRP scrapie. Instead of seeing those beta strands, we see this, this red helix which is really what is called a beta helix. That's over to the right. And we believe that this beta helix uh, is the region that is producing all of the beta sheet signal when we look by optical spectroscopy. But let me stress again, this is only a model, and it may not be correct. Now, as PRPC is converted into PRP scrapie, there are several intermediates along the way. One of them we call PRP star, and we believe that's when PRP is binding to a protein uh, that we call protein X because we still don't know what it is. 
PRP star is then converted into a protease-sensitive form of PRP scrapie discovered by Yuri Safar when he developed a new uh, immunoassay. And then eventually, this, this protease-sensitive form turns into a protease-resistant form. And sometimes, the cells of the brain uh, liberate proteases that end terminally truncate the protease-resistant PRP scrapie to form PRP27, 30, or slightly smaller pieces of PRP that then polymerize into amyloid. But that, let me stress, is a non-obligatory event. Here we see PRPC being made in the endoplasmic reticulum, right next to the nucleus. And then the protein makes its way through the Golgi and out to the cell surface, shown by the little green balls. It's attached to the cell surface by a glycolipid anchor, which can be released by the enzyme PIPLC, a phospholipase. We believe that PRPC is converted into PRP scrapie, the little squares, within these cholesterol-rich microdomains, or rafts, and sometimes the rafts coalesce to form cavioli. If the protein is directed to clathrin-coated pits, then it is not converted into PRP scrapie. And we believe that's because you need the cholesterol-rich microdomain as well as a protein that I've mentioned in the previous slide, protein X, which is shown in pink. Now, eventually, the PRP scrapie makes its way all the way to the bottom of the slide to the lysosomes. And I'm going to come back to that a little later in the talk and tell you about how PRP scrapie is turned over. Now, PRP, we thought, was a protein which was totally unique, and there was nothing else like it for a long, long time. This was the conventional wisdom. But in a series of studies that were carried out in collaboration with Lee Hood, who was at the University of Washington at the time these were done, and is now in the Institute in Seattle, along with David Westaway, who's now in Toronto, Richard Moore, who's returned to Edinburgh, and Patrick Tremblay, and many others. Uh, Fred Cohn is still at UCSF. Uh, we were able to identify a second gene. And this gene is called Doppel. And that's shown at the bottom. Doppel contains three helices, A, B, and C, just like PRP. It contains two dose disulfide bonds. It has N-link carbohydrates. It's it anchored to the cell surface. And it has peptides at each end, shown in blue, like PRP, that are cut off when the mature protein is formed. The structure of Doppel was worked out by Peter Wright and Jane Dyson and their postdoctoral fellow, Wapping Mo. And that's shown in the left in this slide. And you see that the NMR structure of Doppel is very similar to that of mouse PRP. And here, the first mouse PRP molecule uh, is shown. And that structure, as I mentioned before, was performed by Kurt Wutrich and his colleagues in Zurich. You see the two disulfide bonds in Doppel and the single disulfide bond in PRP linking the long uh, C-terminal helices together. And helix A, in both cases, is out to the left. So these proteins are very similar in structure, but I want to stress that they're very different in sequence. They diverged long, long ago. This is a very ancient gene duplication. And so in terms of sequence homology, they're only 25% homologous. But structurally, they're very, very homologous. Now, the way Doppel was discovered was that there were knockout mice that developed disease in Nagasaki, Japan. These are PRP knockout mice after about a year and a half of age. And these contrasted with the knockout mice made by Charles Weissman in Zurich and the ones made by Gene Manson in Edinburgh. It eventually became clear that, when the, that in certain constructs, like the one in Nagasaki, there was a high level of doppel message. And that was created by aberrant splicing that created these intergenic transcripts at very high levels. Now, the intergenic transcripts are there at very low levels normally. So these are, this is a very interesting splicing situation. And three of them are normally made. But 
they are upregulated in some PRP knockout mice, and the presence of Doppel in the brain causes neurodegeneration and the animals die. But here, Doppel is a toxic molecule. It's totally different from the prion. Now, let us turn to the human prion diseases. The sporadic form of human prion disease is the most frequent. It's found uh, about 85%, it accounts for 85% of all prion diseases, and it's found at one per million across the earth. The next most common are the inherited forms, such as GSS and fatal familial insomnia. These are autosomal dominant diseases affect, affecting 50% of the family members. The infectious forms of the disease are Kuru, uh, iatrogenic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease caused by growth hormone derived from human pituitaries before 1985 when recombinant growth hormone uh, became the standard of medical care, and more recently, new variant CJD that we'll talk about. Sporadic CJD is a disease of older people, and if you look at the l solid black line, you see that the death rates are maximal for sporadic CJD between the ages of 70 and 80. So this is a disease of older people. It's an age-dependent disease, and we don't understand why age is so important, but like Alzheimer's disease, like Parkinson's disease, like ALS, this is an age-dependent neurodegenerative disease. Now, in terms of the genetic forms of the disease, the first pedigree was drawn as early as 1930 but no one understood the significance of this. In 1973, Ray Roos, who's currently the head of neurology at the University of Chicago, who was working with Carlton Gajusek and Joe Gibbs at the NIH at the time, published a paper on the transmission of familial CJD cases to monkeys and apes. Three explanations were offered over the, over the subsequent 10 years to explain this work. First, that the CJD virus was transmitted among family members living in close proximity. Second, there was a genetic predisposition to a ubiquitous CJD virus. Or third, like AIDS, there was vertical transmission of the CJD virus from parent to offspring. All of these turned out to be incorrect. And in 1989, Karen Chow, who was a neurology resident, uh, who had completed her residency, I should say, at UCSF, and then came to work as a postdoctoral fellow with me, discovered that there was a mutation in the PRP gene that was causing familial forms of prion disease. Karen is now a professor of neurology at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, very close to you. What Karen did was to clarify this entire area of biology, and her experiments were absolutely critical in the development of the prion story. It became clear from her work uh, in a collaborative study with uh, Tim Crow in England and with Yurgat at Columbia University in New York, that mutant PRPC was refolding more readily into PRP scrapie when a mutation was present that caused a familial form of these diseases. Now let us turn to the mad cows in Europe for a moment. The transmission of prions from mad cows to people in Europe has created a public health crisis that threatens the food and blood supplies worldwide. And many of you probably realize that about a month ago, the first case of mad cow disease was discovered in Japan. And in recent weeks, the scare from this one case of mad cow disease has decreased the meat consumption in Japan by 20 to 30 percent. Now, how did mad cow disease arise? Mad cow disease is due to industrial cannibalism. And we believe that it arose either from sheep, shown at the top right, with passage into cows, or it began as a, spont as a sporadic case of prion disease in a cow, as shown at the bottom left. Whichever way it began, mad cow disease then spread uh, to humans from the consumption of beef. Now, I'm going to show you some data as long, and talk about other people's work at the same time, which really makes a very tight link between mad cows and the development of new variant CJD. This is one of many, many newspaper articles with more than 
describing the horrors of a hundred young people who have now died of this, horrible, of this awful disease. So these are primarily teenagers and young adults with very few people over the age of 30. The pathology is very atypical, as I'll show you in a moment. The disease appeared about uh, a decade after uh, the cows. If you look at the small graph, you see the peak in 1992 of cattle with BSE, the brown squares, and the first patients with the disease shown in 1995, and the numbers going up year by year. <clears throat> the disease is restricted to the UK, except for two cases and three cases in France and one in Ireland. And we'll talk more about the link between mad cow disease and BSE in a moment. This is an MRI scan of a patient who is dying of new variant CJD. This is a T2-weighted image. And you can see the very intense uh, white areas. And then to the, to the right and the left of these white areas in the center of the brain, we see more intensities. And the problem with this slide, I guess, is that I really can't point this out because I've lost the use of the cursor uh, in the power book. So maybe the best thing to do is say that this is a very similar picture to uh, that found in sporadic CJD, but at the bottom you see these sort of hazy white images. Uh, they're very difficult, though, for me to describe without the cursor. And, but this is a very typical image of a patient dying of new variant CJD, and it differs from sporadic CJD. Now, the pathology... Pathology is shown here, and you see the cortex uh, of the brain, uh, and you see the cerebellum. And there are all these vacuoles which are found, and these vacuoles have plaques within them. And this is very typical of new variant CJD, and the, f and the presence of plaques is different uh, in sporadic CJD where there are no vacuoles surrounding the plaques. Now, how do we try to link uh, new variant CJD with cattle or to show that it is unrelated? What's happened in the, pre in the last few years is it has become very clear that the big biological question which made people think that a virus causes these diseases has been answered, and that question was, how can there be different strains of prions or distinct varieties of prions? It turns out that the distinct varieties of prions are enciphered in the conformation of the prion protein, PRP scrapie, and not in a nucleic acid. This makes prions much, much different from viruses, of course. Uh, and we never thought that distinct phenotypes could be enciphered in a protein, but that's what happens. Now, how can we look at the phenotype of the disease? We can measure incubation times, which I'll show you. We can look at vacuolation profiles, and we can begin to look at the molecular properties of PRP scrapie, such as the size on an electrophoretic gel. These are experiments by Mike Scott, where we took new variant CJD and we passaged it into mice that are susceptible to human prions. And you see that if we put sporadic CJD into these mice, we have incubation times of about 200 days. But with new variant CJD, the incubation time is over 500 days. And these mice are not susceptible to uh, prions from mad cows. If we now look at this slide, you see the curve all the way out to the right, the black diamonds. That shows you that animals get sick between 300 and 700 days on the initial passage into these mice carrying the human PRP gene, or a chimeric human mouse PRP gene. On second passage, the white squares, the incubation times fall into two groups. So there's a shoulder in the curve. So one group is about 200 days, the other is about 350 days. On third passage, we now see the, the red uh, and the blue curves, 
So the blue curve represents the long incubation time and the uh, red curve, the short one. So we have at least two strains that we have been able to uh, bring out. And all of the data to the right, which is a little too complicated to go through, uh, shows that there are, in fact, many more strains. Now, we got a completely different picture when Mike Scott and Glenn Telling and Jim Mastriani and others, uh, and Jim Mastriani is now at the University of Chicago and Glenn Telling at the University of Kentucky. When we carried out a series of experiments where we passaged new variant CJD into transgenic mice that express a bovine PRP gene. Here you see that all the mice become ill at 260 days, and sporadic and familial CJD do not make these mice sick. About the same incubation time is required for BSE and, this, and a shorter time for scrapie. Here's the actual data simply showing BSE into mad cow, from mad cows, 240 days, and on second passage in these bovinized mice, it's 236 days. So the curves overlie each other. That's slightly different for new variant CJD. Here we have human prions, but now in contrast to the humanized mice, here with the bovinized mice, all of them get sick with an incubation time of about 270 days. And on next passage, there's a 45-day reduction. So this would be called by many people a species barrier. Uh, and then on subsequent passage, it's the same. Here you see neuropathology, and this is very good evidence that BSE uh, is the cause of new variant CJD. This is the work of Steve DeArmon. When sheep scrapie was passaged into these bovinized mice, uh, we see no amyloid plaques. The dark staining represents the amyloid. And in the ponds, uh, we only see a fine granular appearance. But in the corpus callosum in the ponds of bovinized mice inoculated with BSE from cows or new variant CJD from humans, we see an indistinguishable neuropathologic picture with huge numbers of PRP amyloid plaques. So as I've said, the neuropathology is indistinguishable, whether the prions start from cows or humans, and the incubation times are very similar. The surprise was that these mice are more susceptible to sheep prions than they are to bovine prions. Natural scrapie from Suffolk sheep dying in the United States causes disease in about 210 days, and the same is true on second passage. So we began to think about this in a new way, and this is largely Mike Scott's work. And Mike began to believe that perhaps, and this is hypothesis still, that the BSE strain shown by the little red cube is present in sheep, but there's not much of it, and that its multiplication is restricted in sheep by the faster growing scrapie strains, which are shown by the blue cubes. But that what happened was that during the rendering process, the scrapie strains were destroyed because they were more heat labile, and the BSE strain survived. And now the BSE strain, again through the meat and bone meal, was passaged into the cows on multiple cycles of passaging, uh, as I showed initially due to industrial cannibalism, and then eventually high titers of the BSE strain emerged in the cows, and these were, patho these were and are pathogenic for humans. Now let's talk about therapeutic approaches in the last part of the lecture. We've undertaken many different approaches, and others around the world have taken even additional approaches. In a study with Fred Cohn, uh, we've undertaken to capitalize on dominant negative inhibition of prion formation that was discovered by Kiyotoshi Kaneko. We've used this also in gene therapy studies that I won't have time to talk about, 
And in both of these studies, Veronique Perrier, who's returned to France, and Andrew Wallace, who is now in Boston, have played a major role. We've also done some work trying to enhance the clearance of prions. And this work was done by uh, Serchai Sapatopone, who is now professor at Dartmouth. I'll tell you more about the replication or the inhibition of prion replication by site-specific antibodies, and I'll mention a small amount of work about quinacrine and a clinical trial that we've started. Now, Dennis Burton and Anthony Williamson, along with the help of David Peretz and others in San Francisco, but Anthony Williamson and Dennis Burton are at the Scripps Institute in La Jolla, created a library of anti-PRP recombinant fabs. These bind to epitopes all along the PRP molecule as color-coded here. The D13 binds toward the end terminus, more to the middle of the molecule is D18, and R1 and R2 bind at the very C terminus. They're shown in green. When David Peretz added these antibodies at the increasing concentrations to cultured cells producing PRP scrapie, what he found was that D18 and D13 were the best. D18 being the best of the three. And then uh, R1 and R2 uh, were less good than D13 or D18 and R72 did not work at all. We found an excellent correlation uh, with D18, which bound the best and had the highest avidity, with D13 also uh, reasonably good. Uh, when we did fax analysis, looking at the binding of these recombinant fabs to the cell surface. And that's shown here, the highest curve being the red balls. Now, what really surprised us was when we did a series of clearance studies. And with these clearance studies, it eventually became clear to us that we could remove the PRP scrapie with these antibodies. And this is simply shown if you look at the gels, the panel A for D18, we have one day, two days, three days, and four days. And after about a day, we see very little signal of the PRP scrapie. And this is shown uh, by densitometric tracing in panel B with the red balls. That's D18 antibody binding to uh, the surface of the cells. And eventually, the PRP scrapie disappears. Now, we know that it disappears completely because we've done a study where we actually looked at the curing of the cells. So in the top panel, we, they've been ex the cells have been exposed to bud for the antibody for a week, then two weeks, and then three weeks. And if we simply look at the D18 uh, in the middle, if we now assay at time zero after exposure for a week, two weeks, or three weeks, we see with D18 there is no PRP scrapie. If, on the other hand, we wait a week or we wait two weeks, and we've only exposed the cells to uh, the D18 antibody for one week, then we see the reappearance of PRP scrapie. But if they've seen the antibody for two weeks or three weeks, it doesn't come back. Now, these experiments have profoundly changed our thinking about PRP scrapie. We thought that PRP scrapie was made of granite, some form of stone, and that it never was cleared. But what these studies have shown to us is that it is clearly cleared. And we now were able to complete a table that was started by David Borchelt and con other contributors to the, these numbers were Byron Coey and Bruce Cheesebro working at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory. And this was back around 1990 when it became clear that PRPC was synthesized very rapidly. The formation of PRP scrapie was relatively slow, three to 10 hours. PRPC could be degraded with a turnover time of about six hours. But it's degra the degradation of PRP scrapie had to wait until this past summer when we published the paper showing that the 
uh, removal of PRP scrapie occurs with a half time of about uh, 30 hours. Now let us turn to the tricyclic drugs. And this is the work of Karsten Korth uh, with some help from Barney May. What Karsten Korth did was to set out to look for some nervous system active drugs that might inhibit in cell culture PRP scrapie formation. And he looked at many tricyclics that are shown here, and the best one was chlorpromazine. And if you look at the western blots, which are shown just to the left of the structure of chlorpromazine, you see that in the presence of five micromolar, there are no PRP scrapie bands. When Karsten Korth went back and looked at the history of the phenothiazines, it became clear to us that we ought to try some other drugs that were seemingly not so related, it were non-psychotropic drugs, but were derived from a common precursor. The common precursor of both the antimalarials like quinacrine and uh, chlorpromazine, the antipsychotic drug, is methylene blue, first used by Paul Ehrlich as a weak antimalarial as early as 1891. In the 1930s, quinacrine was synthesized because there was not enough quinine available that was extracted from Chacona, the bark of the Chacona tree. And it wasn't until much later that quinine uh, could be synthesized uh, in the laboratory and then made widely available, so eventually quinacrine uh, was not used as an antimalarial. Now, when we looked at quinacrine, we saw that quinacrine was five times better, excuse me, ten times better. If you look at the lower panel on the left of the slide and then you see the western blot, you see now we've reduced the concentrations. We have one micromolar, 0.5 micromolar, and 0.1 micromolar. And at 0.5 micromolar, there is no signal. And that is after, that's the presence of quinacrine added to the cell culture. We made a number of other compounds, and these are Barney Mays compounds that are numbered BM51, 49, 48, 47. None of these compounds are as good as the parent quinacrine. When we added quinacrine to the cells and then did a curing study, we found that quinacrine could also cure these cells and that the PRP scrapie did not return. That's shown in the right-hand panel. And when we looked at the concentration of quinacrine in some detail, it became very clear that at about 0.3 micromolar, we removed half of the PRP scrapie. So it was 10, again, in this study, clearly tenfold better than chlorpromazine. And this number is the same as a, from a study published by Dohura uh, in Japan in collaboration with Byron Coe at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory about a year before we uh, independently discovered this because uh, we were unaware of uh, their work with quinacrine. But as I said, it had been published. It was our, our uh, poor command of the literature that we had uh, missed this report. Now, having found that quinacrine uh, works extremely well in cell culture. We set out to study this in mice, and we decided that because of the 70-year history of quinacrine and its treatment of, with treatment of parasitic diseases, all the way from malaria to giardiasis, and the well-documented toxicities in humans of many different ages, that we could skip phases one and two of a typical clinical trial and would easily get approval from the FDA to treat patients with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, and that was the case. So last summer, we applied for approval from the FDA, and they gave it to us, and also the institutional, of course, uh, committees that monitor research, and we began treating people. Now, the two that we've had the longest uh, interactions with are a 20-year-old female with new variant CJD who had a modest but, we believe, significant improvement in her mental status uh, accompanied by slightly diminished ataxia in Korea. But on subsequent exam, meaning after about 60 days on quinacrine, uh, she began to worsen slightly. Uh, so we have mixed feelings at this point. Uh, these are very hard studies to do, of course, since at the moment we have no good biological marker in the blood that can tell us what's happening in the brain.
when we looked at her MRI scan, we thought that it was in fact better on quinacrine after two months of treatment. In several cases of advanced CJD where quinacrine has been used by us and by others, uh, the patients have gone on to die after the drugs were discontinued because there was really no measurable improvement. So what we're trying to do now is to get patients very early in the course of their clinical disease. Uh, I can tell you that trials of quinacrine are progressing worldwide, and I would think within a year we'll have a large body of data. So let me summarize what I've said today. I've told you about the sporadic and infectious forms of the disease, why the wild-type protein is converted into uh, wild-type PRP scrapie. I've talked to you about inherited forms of the disease very briefly, where mutant PRPC has converted into mutant PRP scrapie. In the inherited forms of the disease, the mechanism is clearly a germline mutation. In the infectious forms of the disease, it is transmission from one host to another. And in the sporadic form of the disease, which is the most common, we still don't know the mechanism. We believe that it is likely to be the spontaneous conversion of PRPC into PRP scrapie or a somatic mutation. Now, it may well be that there are very small amounts of PRP scrapie being made all the time. The clearance studies that I showed you suggest that that's very possible and that PRP scrapie may have some physiologic function when it's there at very low levels that we have never appreciated. And then in the disease process, this, the formation of PRP scrapie outstrips the ability to clear PRP scrapie and under physiologic circumstances, and the molecule accumulates, and CNS dysfunction follows. If, on the other hand, we use an antibody or a drug, such as a polyamine, to enhance clearance, now the clearance mechanism gets ahead of the formation, and uh, when we st or we stop the formation, and we allow the clearance mechanism to take over, and under these circumstances, the PRP scrapie is cleared. I think that we can take away four truly unprecedented concepts from the discovery of prions. First, that prions are infectious proteins. They are devoid of DNA and RNA. Second, that the prion diseases may be manifest as sporadic, genetic, or infectious illnesses. Third, that the cellular prion, PRPC, undergoes a profound conformational change when it is converted into PRP scrapie, which then causes the disease. And even more heretical is that PRP scrapie may adopt a variety of conformations, each of which specifies a specific disease phenotype and represents a distinct prion strain. What I'd like to do is just mention how, and it, how much of an incredible journey this has been for me and for the young people to give them sort of an overview of how it's been to be involved in something so unique and so different. Hilary Koprowski gave me this wonderful slide about the four stages of adopting a new idea. This is really a uh, concept that has permeated biology and all of science for many years. And usually people think about this as the first stage of a new idea that the reaction of almost everyone is it's impossible. The second is maybe it's possible, but it's weak and uninteresting. The third is, it is true and I told you so. And of course, the fourth is, I thought of it first. Now, this has been stated in a slightly different way by Lou Thomas, writing in Lives of the Cell many years ago. He said, somehow the atmosphere has to be set so that a disquieting sense of being wrong is the normal attitude of the investigators. It has to be taken for granted that the only way in is by riding the unencumbered human imagination with the special rigor required for recognizing that something can be highly improbable, maybe almost impossible, and at the same time true. Locally, a good way to tell how the work is going is to listen in the corridors. If you hear the word impossible spoken as an expletive, followed by laughter, you will know that someone's orderly research plan is coming nicely along. Now, one can be more brief, and Winston Churchill was able to say it in only a few words. 
Men occasionally stumble across the truth, but most pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. And with that, I'll... Can you hear me, Dr. Prisoner? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we on? <laughs> Say yes. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> the microphone wasn't plugged in. We now have voice. Do we have voice now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Can we hear San Francisco? Yes, I. I'm here in San Francisco. Oh, that's wonderful. We have a question here from the audience. All our garbage ends up in the ocean or other water sources. Do fish have prion diseases? Should we be concerned about this possible source? Well, people have, people have looked for a prion protein gene in fish, and we haven't found one. But I'm sure that in sea mammals there is a prion protein gene, and that means there's PRPC, and certainly there are going to be prion diseases in whales and sea lions and other sea mammals. Okay. We have another question from the audience. What is the physiologic role of PRPC? We don't know the physiologic role of PRPC. There's a lot of evidence that that has been accumulating to suggest that PRPC is a copper binding protein. But what it does with copper is unclear. Do we have any questions from the panel here while we're waiting for some more questions to come up? Stanley, any progress on protein X? Uh, the progress is minimal on protein X. I mean, what what's been happening is the data keeps accumulating that protein X has to exist, but I don't have any good data for candidates. We thought, we, we thought protein X might be NCAM, and we carried out a set of studies in collaboration with Jerry Edelman and Catherine Crossan. This is the work of uh, Gerald Ohm Schmidt, and uh, Gerald's work made it very likely that NCAM was protein X, but when we took knockout mice for NCAM, we found that the incubation time was unchanged. So uh, that's not protein X. That's the latest. Okay. Dr. Fisher? Um, how sensitive are the tests to detect whether or not you have prions. I'm thinking, for instance, in Europe, many people eat calf brain, and I don't suppose you destroy your prions by frying them in, in black butter. So uh, how sensitive are the tests to make sure that your calf brains are, are clean? Right. Well, so the immunoassays are, are not, that are currently being used in Europe are not very sensitive. Uh, this has been a, a constant criticism of these uh, commercially available assays. We've developed a new assay, and we're hoping to, by the, by the middle of next year, have this assay available for uh, cattle in Europe, and in fact, around the world. Okay. We have a question from Dr. Erling Norby. Uh, Stan, Erling speaking. Uh, congratulations Hi, to a very nice presentation, in particular Thank the advance you. of clearing PRP SARC from tissue cultures by antibodies and drugs. Uh, my question is, uh, you showed a, a slide or a picture of uh, the frequency of uh, mad cow disease in the cattle in the UK and the upcoming number of uh, variant CDD in humans. Yes. Do you dare to speculate about where this epidemic is developing in man? Well, I think that most people who look at this are of the belief that uh, the number of cases of new variant CJD is going to keep increasing year by year, at least for the next 10 years. Uh, but it's speculation. Uh, we just don't know. It's clear that the number of cases in the year 2001 will exceed the number of cases in the year 2000. But just how many there'll be by December 31st is not known yet.
I realize it's a very unsatisfactory answer, but I don't really have a better way to uh, sort of look at these uncertainties. My, my guess is, Erling, that in another year or two, the slope of that curve will become clear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions from the panel here? If not, we have another question from the floor here. Uh, have any chaperones been targeted as points of control in the transport of PRP SC? So the answer is that at the moment there are no good candidates. Uh, what is clear is from the study of yeast prions that the work of Sue Liebman and Susan Lindquist and Yuri Chernoff and others have shown that uh, for the psi prion uh, that a chaperone is involved in the formation of the psi prion. Uh, so there is clear precedent for a chaperone uh, being involved, and of course that would be the protein X that we're looking for, a protein that uh, helps convert PRPC into PRP scrapey. Is there another protein then to which PRP scrapey binds that facilitates its transport and thus its infection of other cells? That's a very good question, and uh, we have no knowledge of that, okay. either in yeast or in mammals. Another question from the audience. Is the mechanism by which uh, quinacicrine acts known? Is, if so, are there any known effects of it on PRPC? Yeah, we, we don't know uh, anything about the mechanism of quinacrine action. We know that PRPC expression is not suppressed by quinacrine, so there's PRPC being made. Uh, we do not see quinacrine binding to either PRP scrapey or PRPC. Uh, and the, so the answer is we don't know the mechanism of action to quinacrine. And we're trying to begin to decipher this because I think that would be useful. There are obviously some other proteins involved that we don't know about where, that quinacrine or a metabolite of quinacrine binds to. Here's another question from the audience. Is there a hypothesis why young humans are susceptible to new variant CJD and not older humans? Well, I think that the, the hypothesis is that uh, for reasons that we don't understand at all, uh, the uh, younger people uh, are able to transport the prions and multiply them in their lymphoid system more readily than our older people. But why that is, uh, we have no idea at this point. Okay. And there's another one. How do prions induce the misfolding of wild-type proteins? So we don't know much about the mechanism by which PRPC changes into PRP scrapey or the mechanism by which uh, the sub-35 protein is converted into, a, into the psi form uh, in yeast. Uh, in yeast, though, the mechanism is somewhat different than it is in mammals. In yeast, this occurs in the cytoplasm of the yeast cell. And uh, many features of the yeast conversion process can be modeled uh, with either peptides or the whole protein in a, in a test tube. Uh, that's not true in the case of the mammalian prions, although there are some people who claim to have been able to uh, create the modification create the multiplication of prions, uh, there has not been good confirmation of that work. Uh, in, uh, the, in the mammal, as I showed you, this process occurs in a very specific cellular compartment. It's the raft, the, the cholesterol-rich microdomains, or when the rafts coalesce to form these cavioli. So they're, prob they're probably one or two or three proteins i.e. protein X, that are involved in this very special microdomain in the conversion process. But the mechanics of this we don't understand. Okay. Yes, uh, Sir John Maddox would like to ask you a question. Uh, Stanley, um, you, we first met in 1981, you may remember, at UCSF, and then you kindly talked at the Nature Conference some years afterwards. What I wanted to ask was about the situation in Britain where a hundred people so far have been infected with VCJD. 
As I understand it, there's a polymorphism in the protein uh, of amino acid 27, uh, in which valine or methionine are uh, substituted for each other. At present, all the people infected in Britain have been the more susceptible homozygote, which I think is methionine. For one thing, this is the question, uh, for one thing, how did it come about that um, the different uh, proteins uh, behave differently in these circumstances? Is it that the substitution uh, enhances the folding weight of one or the other? And second, um, on the question of what, what actually happens, uh, what, uh, on the question of the mechanism, what's being done to find out how it is that one protein can, uh, a misfolded protein can in fact uh, induce the misfolding of others? Well, let me, try to, let me try to answer the polymorphism question first. Uh, the polymorphism is at uh, residue 129, and you're absolutely correct, it is a methionine or a valine. Uh, just to put this in a little perspective, uh, about 35% of the population are methionine, methionine, about 5% are valine, valine, and the rest of them are methionine, valine. The, it's not surprising that uh, a very large group of people uh, that one can look at are, turn out to uh, have all methion be methionine, methionine in these hundred cases in the sense that, th that about a third to almost a half of the population are methionine, methionine. But now why is that? It, it, it looks as though, and a lot of this work comes from John Collins uh, many years ago, that most people with sporadic CJD are methionine, methionine, or valine, valine. And that if you are heterozygous, you seem to be protected. And that's probably because a protein with methionine, a PRP scrapie, doesn't interact well with a PRPC that's valine and vice versa. So it's thought that if people are going to come down who are methionine valine uh, with new variant CJD, that it will be much later. Now coming back to methionine, methionine, why, aren't the, why don't we see some valine, valine people? Well, it may well be that the strain of prions, which is very unusual, as I showed you in my talk, where the strain of new variant CJD this is a human prion, transmits into bovinized mice much better than humanized mice, in contrast to all other human prion diseases that we've looked at, that this particular fold does much better in replicating itself on a methionine backbone, meaning a 129 polymorphism with methionine, than it does with a valine. And the opposite probably is true with growth hormone. So iatrogenic CJD induced by growth hormone, there are a very large number of valine, valine cases. So I, my guess is that this is a strain issue. Now all of this is bound up in your second question of what is being done to decipher this mechanism. Uh, I think people are looking for auxiliary proteins. People are trying to develop an in vitro conversion system that actually produces large amounts of infectivity, but that has not been successful because such a system would allow us to dissect all of the components. People are trying to get information about the structure of PRP scrapie. And until the two-dimensional crystallography, or what is called electron crystallography that I showed you today, where we're using this to try to constrain the models and to get much better in EM images for image reconstruction uh, by using a much better microscope now that we've just obtained. Uh, the only data that I know of that was available about PRP scrapie structure was that derived from antibody studies using the panel of antibodies that I showed you along with others and also the optical spectroscopy data using CD and uh, 
Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. But I am unaware of anything else that is being done at this moment. Be there are attempts uh, here in the Bay Area, Alex Pines and David Wemmer, to use solid state NMR on peptides, meaning 50 MERS, that induce a genetic form of prion disease in mice. But we really lack the technology to uh, get at the structure of an insoluble protein uh, which is not made in enormous quantities in, in a mammal. This is very, very difficult. Okay. Another question Thanks, from the audience. Excuse me. Uh, is there any similarity in brain pathology in any of the three varieties of prion diseases and that found in Alzheimer's disease? So the answer, the answer to that question is there are extreme similarities. Uh, there are forms of prion disease, one of them studied by Martin Farlow and Bernardino Getty in great detail at the University of Indiana. This is an Indi what is called the Indiana Kindred that have amyloid plaques that are surrounded by neurofibrillary tangles. Now these amyloid plaques contain PRP amyloid and not the A beta of Alzheimer's disease. So here the pathology without antibodies is truly indistinguishable from Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Just a couple more questions here from the audience. Uh, is the appearance of BSE in the United States inevitable? I think so. Uh, my guess, we don't, in the current Japanese case, which is probably the most instructive to talk about, we don't really know the origin of uh, BSE in the cow that was diagnosed as positive. Is this a sporadic case of BSE that occurred like sporadic CJD, or is this case the result of feeding practices where there was some prion tainted meat and bone meal or some other form of feed that was brought from Europe and then uh, transmitted the prions to the cow? The answer is we don't know, but my guess is that in the United States, as we begin to look more and more, as the tests get better and better for prions, that we will find cattle that are infected. Now, are they infected from Europe? The answer, I think, will be no. And in the case of the Japanese cow, the answer is we still don't know. Okay. Another related question. In the U.S., there's a disease similar to scrapie uh, that's been described in elk and deer. Uh, does this involve a similar mechanism, and uh, could the hunters be in danger of being infected? All right, so the disease that's being talked about is chronic wasting disease. It's found in mule deer and elk and white-tailed deer throughout the Rocky Mountains in the United States and then in the Rocky Mountain Range in Canada. Uh, this is a prion disease. They have <laughs> large numbers of PRP amyloid plaques in the brains of these animals. And does this uh, disease pose a threat for humans? Uh, the answer is we don't know. There have been, in recent years, uh, three or four young people who were deer hunters who came down with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Uh, and, the answer, and we just don't know whether there's a relationship between their CJD and that in the deer. In all of these cases, we suffer from the same lack of expert technology. We have, very, we have a very difficult time saying that a prion in any individual species came from another species or came from another source. And that's because there is no nucleic acid. So there's no unique genetically determinable material that is such as a virus where we would find the virus in the mule deer or in the elk or the white-tailed deer and now find it in the human. Instead, what we have is a protein that we all have, which has now changed its conformation in the mule deer or the elk or the white-tailed deer. We have a hunter with CJD, and was, and, and, and was the per that person's CJD due to the ingestion of prions from the mule deer or elk that now stimulate the conversion of human PRPC into human PRP scrapie? We can only begin to decipher that through understanding the conformations of these proteins. And as, and as I answered to John Maddox in the previous question, the technology for all of this is so primitive 
uh, even though it's so elegant when you have a water-soluble protein, but so primitive with these insoluble prions that uh, we have many, many uh, years of research to do and new technologies are needed to be able to answer the kinds of questions that have been posed. Okay. Do we have any other closing questions from panelists here? And I have one last question from the audience. Do you eat beef? <laughs> the answer is yes, I eat beef, but it's geographically restricted. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Prisoner. Thank you. Thank you.